Bless the Lord, everyone, and welcome to another of our Bible study. Um, in today's Bible study, we are going to be looking at the book of Romans. Um, let us just pray before we start. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and for your mercies. Lord, we thank you for today and for blessing us with another day. Dear God, as we are about to go into your book, into your scriptures, Lord God, we pray that your spirit will be here with us, that it will lead and it will guide us into your truth. Have your own way, God. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and the praise belong it unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we are looking at the book of Romans in today's um, Bible study. And as you know, Romans was written by the great Apostle Paul. It was written by, or the, the author by um, the Apostle Paul. In, in the salutation of the book, Paul identified himself as being the bond servant of Jesus Christ. The, he, he, and this, this, is common or this is he normally does this in terms of how he introduces himself in most of the the, the, uh, the epistles that he has written um, and the the salutation here give us um, insight as into the 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 motto or what we say the governing principle of of Paul's life he, you know he says that as much as is in him he is ready to preach the gospel and as I said, this is the hallmark of Paul's life. The epistle itself was dated in um, was dated back in AD 58. Um, it was written approximately 28 years after Paul got saved. And so the Paul that wrote this epistle was a mature saint. He wasn't, you know, the young Paul, but he was mature in the faith at this time when he was write, writing this epistle. And of course, the book was written while Paul was at Corinth. Next slide, please. So just a bit of a background of the book. The epistle itself was written to pave the way for Paul's arrival to Rome. In the, um, so, you know, Paul had planned to visit Rome and um, in, 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 in preparing the way or preparing the church to receive him, he wrote the epistle of Romans to the church. And this epistle to the Romans was written, as I said, to prepare in, in preparation for his ministry, um, his coming ministry in Rome. Continue. Next slide, please. And so, incidentally, the the book of Romans, or the letter to the Roman church, is the only letter that Paul wrote to a church that he didn't found. It wasn't the start of the church. Um, all the other churches that Paul would have written to, he would be the, you know, these were churches that he would have started himself. But the church of Rome wasn't started by Paul, but yet Paul wrote the epistle of Romans unto him. So let us look at, at some of the principles that, uh, that is outlined in the book of Romans. So Paul says that the gospel reveals, so in, in Romans chapter 8, sorry, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 um, down to about 18, we find the theme of the epistle. And, and let me just read it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. That is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So here Paul is saying that in verse 17 and verse 18, Paul is saying that, that the righteousness of God is revealed in chapter 17. 
And he also speaks about the wrath of God being revealed in chapter 18. So let us look at in terms of the righteousness of God revealed. The, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Okay, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. And so this is God's strategy. This is God's strategy for saving mankind. This is God's plan to rescue humanity from the dominion uh, of sin and from the penalty of sin. Okay? And so there's no other salvation, there's no other provision that God has made to save mankind outside of the gospel of Christ. You know, it went on further to say that the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. And this comes through faith, of course. And so the, the, the righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel. And, there is, and, and again, there is no other means for us to have access to obtain the righteousness of God and to even have knowledge of the righteousness of God. You know, God has, God has um, ordained, as it were, the gospel, the, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ as the tool, as a strategy to bring salvation to man, one, and two, to reveal the righteousness of God to man. Amen. So as, as, as it is said in the book of Habakkuk 2 and verse 4, the just shall live by faith. Amen. The just shall live by faith. So the, 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 the gospel is the only way, as I said before, the gospel is the only way one can know and obtain the righteousness of God. Next, please. Um, so that the, the, the scripture said that the wrath of God is, is also revealed. So first we look at, there's two things that is revealed. In chapter 17, we, we speak about the, the um, righteousness. Sorry, in, in chapter 1 and verse 17, we speak about the righteousness of God being revealed. And now in chapter 18, we, we, are, we are now speaking about the wrath of God being revealed. And God's wrath is revealed upon all unrighteousness and unholiness of men. And when you read the scripture, you know, it is pointed. You know, it seems as if he is actually making reference to an actual set of people. Most of the scholars, um, however, keep it general and say that it is, it is the heathen, it is the Gentiles that he is... Um, he is referring to here. And, um, and what the Bible says is that the, the invisible things of God are clearly seen through the things that are made. Okay? So the scripture said that when they know God, when they, when, they, when, when, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but they, you know, they, they became vain. And, and because of this, you know, God, God, God gave them up to a reptilian mind. And I said, we'll come to that. But here the scripture said that the knowledge, of, the knowledge that God is speaking of was preached by things made. For example, the heavens. You know, the scripture in Psalms says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth um, his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth. Um, knowledge or giveth knowledge. And so when you look at it, you know, God is actually holding these persons accountable for the knowledge that would have been passed on to them from, you know, from the heavens as it were, from, 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 the, from, from things that was created. And um, and not necessarily a preacher coming um, to preach to them. So God holds these people accountable for the message preached by 
inanimate object, how much more will he hold us accountable for the truth that he has revealed to us through his servant, um, Jesus Christ, um, uh, to the servant of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so the scripture continues to say that the, their hearts were darkened because they did not treat God the way he deserved. They didn't, they didn't worship him. They didn't give him what he deserved. And as Christians, we are to always try and, and give God the praise and the honor that is due unto his name. And yes, I know that, that, that most of us cannot really um, do justice in terms of the good to the goodness of God. We cannot do justice in terms of worshiping God as we ought, as, as he deserved. But we are to try to give him glory. We are to try to give him praise. We are to try, <coughs> sorry, we are to try to offer up wor worship that is, you know, in line with, with he, the fact that he's God, the fact that he's so great, and the fact that, you know, he is the creator of all things. We are to try to give him worship that is in line with who he is. Um, because the Bible said these persons, when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. They didn't worship him as God. They didn't give him all the praise and the honor that is due unto their name. Uh, and because of this, the scripture says, um, when, um, when we fail, rather, to worship God as we ought, then something else will take that place of worship. So because they failed to give God the glory and the honor that he is due unto his name, you know, something else took the place of their worship. And, they, and, and, and so they became idol worshiper, as it were. The scripture went on to say, if we, so if we do not receive the love of the truth, you know, God will send a strong delusion for us to believe a lie. And so we are to, we are to, as I said before, we are to try to give him the honor and the, and the praise that is due unto him while, you know, we have that knowledge of God in our hearts. So the, the, the scripture says that God gave them up um, in three verses. In chapter 24, he said that God, sorry, in verse 24, he said that God gave them up unto uncleanness. In verse 25, he said that God gave them up to vile affection. And in chapter 28, it says that he gave them up to, sorry, in verse 28, he gave them up to a reptobate mind. And so these were, as I said before, these were the heathen nations, these were the Gentiles. God had revealed himself to them through the things that is made, the, the, the scripture says, through the heavens that declare the glory of God, through the firmament that showeth his handiwork. These things, normally when you look at these things, we just see, we just see cloud and, and mountain. However, God, is, God was able to use these things to speak to them and to reveal himself unto them and to reveal some knowledge of him to these people. And now the fact that, you know, they did not treat this knowledge that was handed down to them by these, these objects, these things, they didn't treat it with what? With, 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 with the type of reverence that it deserved. And so God gave them up, as it were, you know, to, to their own um, devices. The, 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 the scripture went on to say, we, um, sorry, we are to be thankful every day we get up and have a desire to live for God. Because, um, trust me, our desire to live for God it comes from God himself. The Bible says it is he that worketh in us. But to do, but to will, sorry, and to do of his 
good pleasure. If God withdraw himself, his spirit, you know, we would be ashamed of some of the things that we'll do, as, as seen here in this scripture. So what Paul was, so what Paul was doing, he was actually um, showing that the Gentiles, you know, they had an opportunity to know God through the elements, through the clouds, through the things that God used to minister to them. They had an opportunity to know God through these things, and they did not seize the opportunity. You know, they became vain in their heart, in their mind, and so God gave them up as it were to a, a reptobate mind. Or, you know, he, the Bible says that he gave them up unto uncleanness. He gave them up unto their own vile affection. You know, it is God, it is the spirit of God that restrain us, that prevent us from doing some of the things that comes to our mind. And so, the, the, you know, the scripture says that, the scripture says that, you know, the spirit of, of God will not always strive with us. And, 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 and so it is that God, he, he literally strives with us to allow us, you know, to keep us in check, to, in, sorry, to keep us in check and to keep us grounded in the truth. And so when we, when we resist that to a point, you know, God will leave us up to our own devices. And a mind that is void of Christ is a reptobate mind. A mind that is void of, of, of God is a mind that will do anything because God is our moral compass, as it were. Um, next slide, please. And so these are the, so this, this slide through the, um, show the progression of sin um, in, these, in the life of these persons that Paul identified here. So the first thing was that there was indifference to God. Although men knew God existed, they did not glorify him or, th or were thankful um, for his providence, right? Then that moves now to idolatry, idolatry. Ignoring the truth they had, men imagine and profess themselves to be wise in their foolish thoughts. Um, then this idolatry turns to sexual impurity. Um, without, so without God as the source of morality, they began to indulge in sexual impurity impurity, degrading their own body, as it were. This then progressed to, as the scripture speaks about, homosexuality, because men persisted in lust, God gave them up to vile affection, and here vile affections, um, homosexuality is one of those things that are identified in the scripture as being vile affection. And then finally, they have what is called a debased mind or a reptobate mind. Um, God gave them over to a mind that is debased, you know, a mind that is void of morality, void of, you know, any, any godliness, void of natural affection towards, you know, others, a mind that is completely skewed and messed up um, due to sin. So then, after Paul dealt with the, the heathen nation, he now look at what you know, scholars call the moralizers. Um, these were probably Jews. Um, these men were who excuse their own sins, but condemn others. And this could be found in Romans chapter 2 and verse 1 to 16. They are indignant at other people's sins while being indulgent of their own. And so these persons, when they see sin in others, they are quick to identify it. And they become even righteously indignant as it were. But yet the same sin may exist in their lives. And they, and they are not, they are not you know, they, they are, there is no righteous indignance when it comes to them. And so Paul, you know, point out these people as being hypocrites, really. And if you look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 5, Jesus himself 
spoke about these persons and says that, you know, how is it that you are able to see the, the beam? You know, you are able to see the, the moat, rather, that is in thy brother's eye, but you are not able to see the beam that is in thine, thine own eyes. And so, you know, the, 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 the beam are, a, you know, what, what the translators say is really a plank, a, a big piece of wood, and it is in your eye, and you are not seeing that. But yet still, there is a, a, a moat or a little speck of wood, you know, um, in thy brother's eyes, and you are able to pick up on that, and you're, you're saying to him, come brother, let, I let, let me take out the, the moat that is in your eye, and behold, there is a beam, <coughs> sorry, in thine, thine own eyes. And so this is the behavior of, the, of hypocrites, or what, you know, scholars call moralizers. They, 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 they are seemingly unable to identify sin in their own lives, but they take pleasure in seeking out and pointing out sin in other people's lives. And so the next set of people that Paul address, addressed here were the Jews. And he, he said that the Jews were also guilty before God. So as you know, the Jews were, they received the oracle of God and by oracle of God, I'm talking about the, um, the, the utterances of God. They would have received this, the, 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 the Old Testament canon. You know, they, 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 these were handed down by the Jew. And because of this, you know, the Jews became, as it were, a bit, a bit high-minded, you know, a bit um, boastful, as it were. To say that you know, you know, they have received, you know, God uh, as the as the nation that God was was dealing with, and they make their delight in the law of Moses again that was handed down to them, and they um, and they, however, we find that they weren't obeying the law. They were just they just had a knowledge of the law. And so Paul point them out, point it out, and says that, you know, really, um, circumcision does not profit you anything unless you keep the law. But if you are breaking the law constantly, then, you know, then there is no benefit to being circumcised. And so Paul, and so Paul pointed out the, to the Jews that, you know, they were really sinners. And even though they had the law, they weren't, be, they weren't obeying the law. They weren't keeping the law. So they were just as bad as the Gentiles. They were just as bad as the people before, you know, that had not the law. Amen. Um, and so he went on to encourage that, you know, we should, we, we should seek to be a Jew inwardly. Um, and that the true circumcision is of the heart. Um, and, and, and if we have this true circumcision of the heart, then what it means is that we will have praise of God and not of men. Amen. So here Paul in Romans chapter 2, um, 17 to chapter 3, 18, he actually um, laid out that the Jews were also guilty before God. Next slide, please. Now, in, uh, in chapter 3, verse 9, um, Paul identify that the Gentiles and Jew were both proven to be under sin. And so this is like a, a, a recap. He was actually, you know, saying what he would have covered before. So in chapter 1, he would, he would have identified and showed that the Gentiles were really sinners. And in, in chapter 2, 
uh, at the back end of chapter one, chapter two, he, he, he actually showed that the Jews were also sinners. And so now he was recapping and he was saying that he basically have proven that both Gentiles and Jew were, were under sin. He went on to say that there is none that, um, and in verse, verse 11, chapter 3, verse 11, he said, there is none that understand it. There was none that seeketh God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all unprofitable. And as I said, this is Romans 3 and verse 11. So Paul, so Paul was, he was showing that even though they, that firstly, the, the Gentiles that didn't have the law, however, God actually had made an attempt to reveal himself to them, and that was shown. And now he also looked at the Jews and he said, well, the Jews, you have the law, but you didn't obey it. And so now he is now declaring all men to be unrighteous, all men to be sinners. For, and, and, and this is in verse 23, he summed it up and he said, For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. So now, having, having established that both Jews and Gentiles were sinners, Paul went on now to make a case for the need for righteousness from God. And just to backtrack a bit, it is said that the book of Romans is actually a book that outlines the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in this book, you probably won't find anybody being baptized in Jesus' name and, you know, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. But how the book is actually written, it actually outlines the gospel of God. So the first thing it does is that it shows all men to be sinners. And then the next thing that Paul um, attempts to do is to show or to reveal the, 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 the salvation that God's prov God provides. So after Paul showed that sin was universal and that God's judgment is impartial, he declared God's gift of righteousness to, uh, to be available to all. And this, as I said, this is in Romans 3 and verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so that it is the grace of God that justifies us. And it is not of works. It is not, it's not what you say and do, but it is the, it is, justification is in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we conclude, and, and Paul concludes rather, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So a man is justified by faith without the, the deeds of the law. Next slide, please. So as I said, we are continuing looking at righteousness received by faith. And now Paul is using um, two examples. He's, he's, he is now referring in chapter 4, he's referring to David. And he's saying David also described the blessedness of a man unto whom God imputed um, righteousness. And so the Bible says in, I think in Psalm 32, blessed is the man whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. And so, you know, um, the, 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 the righteousness of God or the justification that David is speaking about here is the justification that we have received as, as um, Christians, as believers in God. Um, and so he also used Abraham as an example. And he said, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so we know the story of Abraham, how that Abraham you know, could not have any, any child. He could not, they, they could not have any children. He and his, his wife, Sarah. And, God, and, and we know how God appeared unto him, unto them, and, and promised them, you know, that they would actually have, you know, they would actually 
um, he will actually give them a child. And the scripture said that Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God. And because Abraham believed God, it was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. And Paul went on to say that when he believed God, he believed God before he was circumcised. It wasn't, it wasn't while he was circumcised that he actually believed God, but it was before. And then he received the seal of circumcision, right? Testifying that he actually believed God. And so here it is that in a same way, you know, with the, the Bible speaks of another seal, and that is the seal, and that is the Holy Ghost. And when we believe God, we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is the seal that, you know, we belong to the Lord Jesus. Next slide, please. So Paul went on to say that the fact that we are justified by faith, we have peace with God. Um, and this peace is speaking about, you know, we, are, we have peace. We are not at war. We are not, um, we are not you know, the Bible says that um, to we, we, have, we, have, we have been reconciled unto God as it were. You know, there's no animosity between us and God. And the fact that we know that our justification is not so much up to us, but it is, it is up to Christ, and all we have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we can be assured, and we can really have peace with God to know that, you know, you know, it's not of our, I don't know about you, but if, if, if my salvation was dependent upon me living right all the time, then I don't know how much peace that would give me. You know, I would always be, you know, anxious to, to you know, to actually, um, I would be thinking that, you know, somehow I might mess it up. But I know that I can have peace that, you know, my salvation is not dependent upon so much upon, you know, me, as it were, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's. But all I have to do is believe on the salvation that Jesus Christ provides. Paul went on to make the point that, you know, we have access to God's grace through Jesus Christ. So access to God's grace is provided through Jesus Christ. I remember as a young convert, you know, and if, if, if I did anything wrong, I would probably stay away from church or even stay away from the prayer room because I, I would think myself so unworthy. And while that is good in a sense that, you know, it does show that there is some amount of reverence there for God and for the things of God, in a sense, it is wrong in, because, you know, I was, I was going, it, it means that the days that I was going to God, you know, I felt that I was probably righteous. But the, the, but the point I'm making is that we really, um, we really can gain access to God's grace and have help, you know, in, in times of need. Not from the, not, not because we have lived for God right all our lives. But we can just simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and having faith in the salvation that Jesus provides. And that will give us access um, to Jesus Christ or to the grace of God. Amen. And so he went on to make the point that we glory in tribulation. Now this is Paul speaking. This is not me. <laughs> You know, this is Paul speaking. And Paul says, we glory in tribulation. And that word glory means he rejoice. He's glad. He's happy. In tribulation. Here Paul underscored that tribulation brings endurance, which then brings hope. So, so Paul is saying he glories in tribulation or he rejoices. 
when things happen, bad things happen, because it will teach him to, or it will, you know, it will teach him to be patient. And uh, patient will give, will allow him to be, you know, to give, to have endurance or, you know, to be, to, to, to hold on in, when, when times get rough. And then that in itself will bring us hope. Um, we, we, we find in, in Corinthians 12 and verse 8 to the, to, in, sorry, in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 8 to 12, Paul speaks about the infirmity that is in his flesh. Um, and again, the, 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 the scripture said that after Paul speak about the infirmities that is in, is, in, is in his flesh or was in his flesh, the Bible says he approached God, I think, three times and said, God, I want you to take this away from me. And God didn't take it away, but God says, my grace is sufficient for thee because my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so what, what Paul was saying was that his infirmity was an opportunity for God to show himself strong in his life. You know, the things that he struggled with, the, you know, scholars disagree. Some persons believe it was his eyesight. Others believe it was something else. But whatever it was, it was identified as an infirmity. And uh, Paul wanted to, to get rid of it. And, you know, God, God said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take it away. Because when you are, it is in your weakest moment that you are, you know, truly strong. And then Paul went on to say that when he understood this, when God explained this concept to him, he said that he went on to glory in infirmity or rejoice exceedingly in infirmities. Right? He glory in reproaches. You know, these are unpleasant things. In necessities, when he doesn't have enough, when he can't make two ends meet, he glories in those things. He glories in persecution, when people speak bad about him. Um, verbal persecution, and even physical persecution, maybe, because, you know, Paul was physically persecuted. And he went, he, he glories in distress. The Bible says, stressful situation. Because Paul, you know, the normal person see these as, as distasteful and things that they should avoid. But Paul see these as an opportunity for God to show himself strong on his behalf. For God, for more of God in his life. And so Paul says, because of this, I will glory in these things. And so I believe if Paul was upon the earth today, he would probably glory in, in the whole COVID-19 um, pandemic. You know? Yes, it is, a, it is a very stressful time, you know, in the world. It is distress, you know? It brings about necessities and all of these things. I believe Paul would actually glory in it because he knows that when these things come up, that God have a way of showing up in a way that he doesn't normally show up or he wouldn't show up before. And so Paul sees these things and these, um, these um, things as opportunity for the glory of God to rest upon him. Amen. And so even Jesus himself um, speaks about this in the gospel. He said, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. We will never experience the true comfort that God gives until we have mourned. Until we have faced some situation that caused us to be broken. And so God said, blessed are the, the, the word there, blessed, means worthy to be envied. Can you imagine? 
you are mourning, you are crying, something bad has happened, you are distressed, and God is saying you are blessed because of this. Because the comfort that God gives you will put you far ahead of where you were before this bad thing actually happened to you. You know, so it is an opportunity, as it were, for God to reveal more um, aspects of himself um, to us. And so Jesus said, blessed are those that mourn. Amen. And so here Paul, was, Paul is saying that um, distresses and, you know, infirmities, reproaches, these things are, are really bad things that happen to people. But Paul is saying that he glories in them and he rejoices when they happen because he recognizes them not as only, he doesn't see them only as persecution, only as trouble, but he sees them as an opportunity for God's glory to rest upon him even more. Bless the Lord. Next slide, please. Therefore, um, he said that as by the offense of one, um, judgment came upon all. Um, so, so sorry. So Paul, uh, um, in, in, in Romans 5, Paul went on now to say that, to do a comparison really of Adam and, and Christ. And, and Paul is saying that we know that Adam, because of Adam's disobedience, then sin entered the world. And, and, um, and anybody that had a natural birth, which we all have a natural birth, then we inherited the sinful nature of Adam. And sin reigned, as it were, in our lives. It is, it is handed down to us. We don't necessarily have to, an to, uh, 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 infant doesn't necessarily have to be taught how to sin. Sin is innate in him because of that, of that sinful nature that we received from Adam. But here Paul now was saying that, yes, this is so, this is true. We did receive this um, sinful nature from, from Adam. And because of what Adam did, we inherit this nature of sin. But he went on now to say that because of the obedience of Jesus Christ, we can have redemption from this sinful nature. Amen? And so, um, you know, Jesus speaks about being, he said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. When we receive that second birth, what we receive is that, that nature of Christ, our you know, that nature of Christ. In the same way as when we were born physically, we receive a sinful nature. When we are born again, we receive a spiritual nature, or we receive the nature of Christ. Amen. And this, and this nature, and so we have two natures in us, as it were. One that, from the old Adamic man, and then the other nature from Christ. And so that we, if we align ourselves to the nature of Christ, then what it means is that, you know, all that, the evil that we received from that Adamic nature will become dormant. And the nature of Christ will, which is righteousness and, and godliness and holiness, will be the prevailing nature in our lives. And so he said that as sin has reigned, and this is the point I was trying to make. So, he, so Paul was saying in the same way as we had that Adamic nature and, and that Adamic nature allows sin to reign unto death. So now that we have this new nature, this nature of Christ, we should have um, righteousness reign unto eternal life. Amen. So that's what Paul, that is the point that Paul was making here. Next slide. Okay. Now in verse 
in, um, in chapter 6 of the book of Romans, Paul, he speaks about death, right? He speaks about that, um, know he not, that so many of us, as we're baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. So Romans um, 6 and verse 3, Paul says that we are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. And so when we take on his name in baptism, we are being identified with Paul's, with, with, sorry, with Christ's death. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of, the, of his resurrection. And this is an interesting point. Because, of, because what, we, what we truly need is to be in the likeness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, after the new man. That's what we truly need. But Paul is saying, in order for us to have this new nature in order for us to to attain unto this resurrection you know this 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 state we have to actually be in the likeness of his death right we have to and so you know jesus said when he was on the earth that unless a grain of seed falls to the ground and dies it abided alone. And so that it is in the it is in our death that we have, we truly have abundance li of life. Um, if we should look at Philippians 3 and verse 10, again Paul is making the same point. He said that he wanted to know God. He said, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And so that Paul was saying that I want to be, I want to attain unto, you know, the resurrection of Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to, I want to know him in the fullness of his power. But, but Paul was saying that in order for me to do this, I have to be made conformable unto his death. I have to be, be in the likeness of his death. And so if I am made in the likeness of his death, if I can imitate his death and, and have that part, then, then I will be able to obtain the, to the resurrection of the dead, as it were, or the newness of life that I seek. So the newness of life, ironically, the newness of life that we all see, that we all you know, want, is obtained when we are made conformable unto the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So he says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. And this can be found in Romans 6 and verse 11. So in, in verse 13, Paul went on to say, um, Neither heal your members as instrument of unrighteousness unto sin. So here Paul is saying that we shouldn't, because we are dead to sin, we shouldn't heal our members. You know, we shouldn't heal our members as instrument of unrighteousness. But we should heal our members unto God as those that are alive from the dead and our members as instrument of righteousness unto God. Um, this is Romans 13. Um, he went on to say, for sin 
shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Um, but now be made free from sin and, and become the servant to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And so Paul was saying that we, should, we shouldn't heal ourselves, you know, to the, to the dictates of um, unrighteousness, but we should really heal our members to the Lord Jesus Christ. A amen. Um, and so when we look at chapter 7, it's not here, but when we look at chapter 7, we would have, we would have gone through most of what you know, chapter 7 deal with, which was that, um, you know, Paul, we, we, we looked at the, 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 the struggle that Paul's identi Paul identified within himself. And, you know, he's saying that the things that I would, I do not. And then the things that I would not, um, that do I. Um, he went on to say how wretched man, that he was a wretched man, and who shall deliver him from the body of death. Um, in chapter 8, which we look at last week, you know, the Bible speaks about how Christ really has delivered him from the body of death, and that Christ has um, made him, made us, as it were, more than conquerors. Um, through Christ. Amen. In verse 9, there's a quick summary of verse 9. Paul speaks about, you know, how the Jews trying to, they, they, they miss it. They didn't, they didn't receive Christ because they, they sought it not by faith. And, um, and but however, and, but they, 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 as it were, sought it through works of righteousness. Amen. And that is covered in, you know, the ordeal of the, of the, of the Jews. Is, you know, that is covered in 8, 9, and 10 to 11 of, of, of Romans. And so now in Romans chapter 12, we find Paul, and he is now doing a summary of, it, of the book of Romans, as it were. He is he's doing a summary of the book. He's concluding, as it were, his thoughts. And he says that um, he is beseeching, he said that I be beseeching you by the mercies of God. He said, therefore, let me just find it here. He said, I beseech you, therefore, Brethren, by the mercies of God, that he present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And so Paul is saying that he is therefore then beseeching them by the mercies of God. And he is now pulling at all that he has covered to date. He is now pulling at that. He's saying that, you know, um, given the fact that in chapter 1, the, 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 the heathen did not, um, the heathen did not um, give God the glory that he deserved. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't treat him as God, as it were. Um, he's now looking at, even in chapter 2, when, where he declares the, the, the Jews to be sinners. Um, are guilty before God. He said, given that also, given the fact that, you know, we have this innate nature of sin. And he went further to say, you know, given that we can be more than conquerors through Christ that loved us. And in, and in chapter 9, he saying, uh, he's also saying, given the fact that the Jew miss out because they seek it not by faith, as it were. He's saying that 
having discussed all of this, then what is going to be your reaction? You know, what, are, what, what is going to be your reaction to this? He's saying that you are to, the only reaction that is reasonable is for you to present your bodies as living sacrifice um, to God. This is the only thing, you know, this is the only way. By doing this, we would, we would basically be avoiding all the mistakes that Apostle Paul would have gone through in that other persons make, you know, leading up to chapter 12. And we will be setting up ourselves for the blessings to be received, you know, from mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. And so as I conclude, you know, in chapter 12, Paul is saying that, I beseech you therefore, brethren, and he's beseeching us by the mercies of God, that we present our bodies living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And he's saying this is our reasonable service. This is our reasonable service. This is the least that we can do when we consider all that Christ has done for us. And he went on to say, um, and be not conformed to this world. Um, and as, as I said before, do not allow the world to put you in his mold so that you come out looking like it. So that you come out, you know, dressing like the world. So that you come out in the fashion of the world. He said, do, be not conformed to this world, but be he transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. And, it's, and it is something, and it is interesting, because the word there, transformation, it comes from the Greek, the, the Greek word, in essence, means to metamorphosize. So Paul is, Paul is giving us here the, um, the, 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 the process that our butterflies go through, as it were. You know, as, as a butterfly is, you know, he's born a, a caterpillar. But, and he remained that way for a while. But there comes a time when that butterfly is transformed, is metamorphosized. That caterpillar, rather, is transformed and metamorphosized and becomes a butterfly. And so this is the the the, the um, this is what Paul is referring to here. He's saying, "Be not transformed, or you know, be not conformed to this world, but be metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind." Um, he went on to speak about that we can prove what is the good and acceptable and the perfect will of God for us. Amen. And so, you know, Paul is saying this, this is what we need to do when we consider all that, you know, as, as you know, we had discussed before. And... In, in chapter 4, he said, for as we have, sorry, in chapter 3, he said, for I say to the grace given unto you, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according to as God has dealt with every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all, have, and, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. And so I was sharing with a group last Sunday about the body of Christ. I was looking at the body of Christ. And I was saying to them that, you know, when it comes to the body of Christ, yes, Paul speak about the fact that we need to be, um, we need to be, um, united, you know, and the role that we play in the body of Christ 
is dictated by the gift that God has really given unto us. And so it would, be few, it would be foolish for me, you know, if God has given me the gifting of a foot for me to try and be an eye. Because God has not gifted me for that. You know, it would be foolish for me to try and be an a, 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 a arm if God wants to, me to be the ear. Because what? Because my role in the church is determined by the gifts that God has granted us, are given unto us, you know. But there is, a, there is more to us being, to being the body of Christ than the unity that involves there. Yes, Paul identifies and Paul shows that there is, you know, that the unity is needed. However, we have to understand that as the church, as the body of Christ, you know, God wants to, God wants to, to operate his body. You know, that's, that's the only way I can put it. Um, most of what I, de I do, I do with my body. You know, if I need to do something, it is my body that I use to do it. If I want to move this tablet, I use my body, it is the hand, and move it. And in the same way, most of the things that Christ would want to do in this world at this time, he wants to do it through his body. He wants to do it through his body. It is his body that he wants to do it through, which is us. And, you know, I was making the point that, you know, that when Jesus was upon the earth, you know, Jesus had some mandates that God has given to him as it were. You know, the, 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 the Bible says that, that God said to, that, you know, in, in Luke, the, the, the scriptures speak about that the spirit of God is upon him and that God anointed him to, in Luke chapter 4, God has anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent him, you know, to, to bind up the brokenhearted, um, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, um, to deliver, you know, those that are broken. And there's a number of things that the scripture outlined that Christ has actually um, was anointed to do. And here's the, here's the scripture. The Bible says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are um, them that are, can you scroll down a bit? Them that are bo um, bound, right? So this is the anointing that, that God has, uh, uh, that was upon Jesus, was for this purpose. A lot of times we speak about the purpose. And we speak about being anointed for a purpose. You know? This is the purpose. This is the reason, as it were, as, as depicted here in Luke why God, why, this, why the anointed was upon Christ. And I was, as I said, I was, I was sharing with the group and I was saying to them that, you know, the, the purpose of Christ has not changed. Yes, he is no longer in this body, in, this, in the body of Jesus Christ, in the physical body of Jesus Christ, the physical body of Jesus Christ. He's no longer in that you know, spear where he's up on the earth physical, physically. But in terms of the mandate, it still remains the same. It's just that he is now using the church as his body to bring out, to, 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 to accomplish this mandate. So God is really depending on the church. Or his plan is to work to the church to... Um, as it were, um, go back to, to verse, the, 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 sorry, the spirit, no, leave it. He is now depending upon the church, as it were, the spirit that has the spirit of God, 
you know. Um, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. So now, Jesus still has that mandate to preach the gospel to the poor. But his plan is to do it through the church, which is his new body. He still has a plan to set, to send, um, as it were, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Jesus still wants to go and heal the brokenhearted. But he wants to do it through his new body, as it were, which is the church. Jesus still wants to preach deliverance to the captives. But he wants to do it through the church. All right? Um, he wants to do it through the church. And so, you know, the, 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 what, 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 what we need to understand what is God's, God's role, or sorry, what, what God is doing as it relates to in this time. A lot of time people ask, what is God doing and, you know, what is the church about? The church is there to fulfill this mandate of God. They, you know, God wants to love this world through the church. You know, when Jesus was upon the earth, he showed, he, he loved the world. The Bible says everywhere he went, he was doing good. And he was able to show compassion. And he, he, he demonstrated the compassion that God, that God has for humanity that was demonstrated in the life of Jesus Christ. And he wants to do the same thing in the church. He wants to demonstrate the, 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 the passion that he has for humanity. He wants to demonstrate the love that he has for humanity. And he wants to do that through the church. Um, finally, final point. The next thing is that Jesus also demonstrated the power of God, or rather, the power of God was demonstrated through Jesus Christ. So when Jesus, Jesus was on the earth, there was a, he, he demonstrated the power of God by doing miracles, by healing the sick, by raising the dead, by opening the eyes of the blind. You know, people said everywhere he went, he was doing good. And this same power is available in the church. And God wants to demonstrate his power through the church. And that's why he says that, you know, I have, um, in Acts 2, he says, you know, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and he shall be witnesses unto me. God has given us power. The same power that was available to Christ is available to the church through Christ to, you know, to do the work and the will of God. But we have to, you know, we have to be aligned to God's plan for the church and for our lives. So I'm going to I'm going to be I'm going to be um, stopping here. I'm going to be stopping here and um, and we will continue um, next week. I'm not sure um, if we will continue with the book of Romans or we will look at some new chap new um, um, book or new topic rather. And so um, I want to thank you for spending the time as we look at the book of Romans. The book of Romans is a wonderful book and um, you really have to just spend time in it to fully understand it. Several persons has indicated to me that they haven't, they, they, they haven't fully understood or they, they haven't fully understood the book of Romans. And so this was an attempt just to kind of bring some clarity, you know, for those persons' sake. And so we're going to be closing off in prayer. Uh, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your mercies. Dear God, we thank you for the great love whereby you have loved us. Dear God, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for what we have discussed. We pray, O oh God, that you will use it, O oh God, to minister to your people, to bring them closer to you, and to allow them to have a greater appreciation of who you are and what you are about. Have your own way, O oh God, as we give you all the glory, all the honor, and the praise belongeth unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your night.